please turn me to Psalm 107, verse 2, as we get ready to make our declaration this morning. Psalm 107, verse 2, and then we will stand up and make our declaration after that. Let's turn to Psalm 107, verse 2. Bible says there in Psalm 100 verse, 100, 107, verse 2, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hands of the enemy. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say that you are redeemed. Say what the Lord has redeemed you from. Declare the fact that you are the redeemed of the Lord. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It's so important to proclaim your redemption. To proclaim the fact that you are the redeemed of the Lord. The Bible says in Revelation 12, 11, That they overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. We need to testify to what the blood of the lamb has done for us. That's what makes it personal. Jesus died on the cross for everybody, but not everybody is saved. Jesus shed his blood for everybody, but not everybody is washed in the blood. What makes it personal? When you testify your faith. In that blood. Amen. So testimony. Declaring. Your saying so is very important. Let the redeemed of the Lord. Say so. Now what do you say? Not I'm still in bondage. You say that you have been. Redeemed. The Bible. Now the word redemption. In the Bible. Really. In the. In the just looking at the use, there are different words used in Greek for redemption, but the key point there, the word redeem means to set free, but also means to be restored to your original state. It carries the idea of a slave being bought out of the slave market and restored as a proper citizen. So Jesus redeemed us. Took us out from slavery and restored us to our place of standing in God. Amen. We are redeemed. Let the redeemed of the Lord. So you say, I am redeemed. Jesus Christ has redeemed us from sin. Sin will not have dominion over you. Jesus has redeemed us from sickness. We are redeemed from every curse of the law. Your body belongs to God. You've been healed by the stripes of Jesus. Jesus redeemed us from Satan. Satan has no dominion over your life. No authority over your life. No rights to influence your life. Except if you give him access. But you're redeemed. Satan has no place in you. No access. No right over your life. The Bible says that Jesus has redeemed us from every lawless deed. He has redeemed us from every lawless deed. Which means no lawless deed, no sinful deed can hold you in bondage. He's redeemed you from every lawless deed. Set you free. The Bible says, Galatians 1, 4, Jesus has redeemed us from this present evil age. That means this present evil age cannot influence you, dominate you, control you. You're redeemed from this present evil age. 1 Peter 1.18, the Bible says that Jesus has redeemed us from the vain manner of living that is handed down to us from our forefathers. Let me say, my great-grandfather was, had a short temper. My grandfather had a short temper. My father had a short temper. That's why I'm like this. Excuse me. Jesus redeemed you from your vain manner of life handed down to you from your forefathers. No excuses. You're redeemed. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Instead of saying, I am like this because my great-grandfather was like this. Don't say it. 
I am redeemed. From Wayne, manner of life handed down to me. I'm redeemed. I'm delivered. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. When you say it, you're making it personal. You're making it effective in your life. It's important to say so. Let's stand up to your feet and say so. If you have your Bibles, hold it high up in the air. Say this with me. This is God's word. This is God speaking to me. I am who God says I am. I can do what God says I can do. I will become everything God has promised. I'm saved, healed, delivered, redeemed. I'm blessed, victorious, prosperous, triumphant. I'm a minister of God, a servant of Christ, and a channel of His blessing to many people. I receive His word. I believe his word and I live by his word. Christ is my master and to him I am in absolute surrender in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. This morning, we <clears throat> would like to just kind of bring this whole um, study on the, on, on, on the theme, on the glory of God, just bring it to some sort of a conclusion this morning, and uh, we'll move on to another topic, but come back to it later. We've been talking about the glory of God, and the fact that God wants His glory to be seen through his people. That's the amazing part. Where God says, my glory shall be seen upon you. That God wants his glory to be seen through each one of his people. And uh, just to review, we, we talked about how God created man in his own image and likeness. The purpose of creating man in his own image and likeness was to give him the capacity to manifest God's glory. 1 Corinthians 11. Amen? So we are created in the image of God and that gives us the capacity to manifest the glory of God. And, and that was God's design, intent, that the earth be filled with the glory of God. That was his intent. The whole earth filled with the glory. Now when we talk about glory, we are talking about, in this context, that glory is really a manifestation of who God is and what he does. What is glory? It's a manifestation of who God is and what he does. So each one of us have been designed to manifest who God is and what he does. Is God a creative God? Yes. So when you manifest creativity and excellence in your place of work, you're manifesting the glory of God. And each of us has been designed to manifest God's glory. Does God have answers to problems? So when you bring solutions to problems in your school, your college, your place of work, you're manifesting God's glory. Because He is the one who has the answer. It's being manifested through you. Is God the healer of sickness and disease? Yes. So when God heals through you, you're manifesting His glory. Because He is the healer. And God says, my glory will be seen through my people. Be seen upon you. Amen? As believers, we have been given that same sonship glory that Jesus walked in on the earth. Remember John 1.14, the Bible says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. As of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. 
So when he walked the earth, Jesus walked in a sonship glory. He did not have the glory of deity which he had left in heaven. John 17, 5, Jesus prayed to the Father. He said, Father, glorify thou me with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So on the earth, Jesus did not have a glory which he did have in heaven with the Father. On the earth, he walked in what we call as a sonship glory, full of grace and truth. And that sonship glory was manifested through grace, truth, and miracles. Now, the interesting thing is this. Jesus said, John 17, 21, 22, The glory you have given me, I have given them. So that sonship glory in which Jesus walked, he gave to his people. So each one of us as believers have within us the sonship glory, the capacity to manifest who God is and what he does the same way that Jesus did. When Jesus ascended back into heaven, he once again received the glory of deity. He is God, exalted to the right hand of the Father. Are you with me so far? So now we want to expand that. I'm just, I just want to add this, this part, this insight to this whole aspect of manifesting the glory of God. And I want to share some, uh, share some additional thoughts on that. Let's go to Numbers, the 14th chapter, please. Numbers chapter 14. This morning, we want to talk about a more glorious ministry. So the sermon title is more, a more glorious ministry. Numbers chapter 14, we're going to look at verses 1 through 21. Numbers 14, 1 through 21. I just want to summarize what's happening. The 14th chapter of Numbers is an incident in the life of God's people Israel, as they were journeying from Egypt into the land of Canaan, they were pretty close, in close proximity to the promised land. They just had to cross over and they'll get into the land that God had promised them. And Moses sends out 12 spies. He says, I want you to go into the land, survey the land, see what kind of land it is, what kind of people live in it, come back with your report. So 12 spies go in there. Do you know the story? They come back after 40 days. 10 of them say, the land is really good, just the way God said it, except there's one problem. There are giants in the land. Can't go. Joshua and Caleb come back and say, yeah, there are giants in the land, but God is with us, and they are bread for us. If they were Indians, they would have said they are chapati for us. You know, whatever. They're bread for us. We'll just go and take it. We'll eat it. We can. Let's go. But the people believed the report of the ten spies. They were so upset. They were upset with Moses. Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? We could have, you know, just lived on in Egypt. Why did you do this to us? And then they were ready to stone Joshua and Caleb. What are you guys telling us? Let's go. They're ready to stone. So then God intervenes. God's glory comes on. And God says, you know, Moses... Here's what I want to do. Let me get rid of this entire nation of people. And I will make of you, Moses, a greater and a mightier nation. I'll get rid of them. I'll start over with you, Moses. But Moses intercedes. He pleads for the people. He says, God, please forgive them. And then this is God's response after Moses' prayer. So the verse 20 of Numbers. Numbers chapter 14, verse 20 and 21. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. Moses, I'm forgiving them. You want me to forgive, I'll forgive. I have pardoned according to your word. Verse 21. But truly, as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Moses, I'm forgiving, but there's one thing I want you to know. Truly, whether it's them or whether it's you, one thing I'm going to do, I'm going to fill the earth with my glory. So God is saying, whether I'm going to use, whether I'm going to forgive and use these people, Israel, or whether I'm going to get rid of them and I'm going to start over with you, Moses, one thing I will do, I will Fill the earth with my glory. 
So here's, this is the heart, this is the desire of God's heart. To fill the earth with his. And here's the second thing. The reason God went about choosing a people and a nation was so that through them, he could fill the earth with his. So why did God go after a nation? Why did God want a people? So that through them, he could fill the earth with his. And God said, I'll do it. As long as truly as I live, this is going to happen. When the people rebel, they want to go back to Egypt. They want to stay with their onions and garlics. Doesn't matter. As truly as I live, I'll make sure this happens. I will fill the earth with my glory. Habakkuk, the prophet, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14. He prophesied, the earth will be filled. Now, he was living in a very difficult time. The nation of Israel, people were doing wrong, wrong things. And Habakkuk still prophesies. In the middle of chapter 2, you read it, Habakkuk 2, 14. Habakkuk says, but the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. As the waters cover the sea, it will happen. So why did God go after raise, choosing a nation and a people? Because he wanted to fill the earth with this. Through whom? Through the people. That's why he went after a people. Now this is where the church comes in. Amen. The Old Testament, we already said this. The Old Testament, Jerusalem. The Old Testament, Israel. The, New Tes the Old Testament, Zion, applies to the New Testament church. So why has God raised up a people called the church? Same purpose. As truly as I live, the earth will be filled with my glory, says the Lord. So through the church, God wants to fill the earth with his glory. A manifestation of who he is and what he does is going to take place through the church. That's why we're here. Amen? So you're not in part of the church just so that you can go to heaven. You've got something to do on earth. In fact, the earth is your main assignment, not heaven. Why did God choose the church? So that the earth will be filled with his. Some people say, I'm waiting to go to heaven. God wants you here on? Please stay. He wants you here. The earth will be filled. With my? See, even if you get to heaven, he's going to bring you back. It's true. Even if you get to heaven, bringing you back here. He says, your assignment is not heaven. It's earth. To see the earth filled with his. So don't be in such a hurry to get to heaven. Let's fill the earth with his glory. Now we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, which is where we want to stay for the rest of this time. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is talking about New Testament ministry and he is contrasting it with Old Testament ministry. Ministry under the Old Testament and ministry under the New Testament. He's drawing a comparison. And uh, Paul picks up or picks out the highest point of Old Testament ministry, which is Moses. Now, I know Jesus said John the Baptist is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. I know that. But 
the one person in the Old Testament who had the greatest manifestation of the glory of God was Moses. The Bible says there was no other prophet like Moses to whom God spoke face to face. And through whom God did such great signs and so Paul picks the high point of Old Testament ministry in terms of the manifestation of the glory of God. He picks Moses. And then this is what he tells us. He teaches us about what New Testament ministry is supposed to be. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's read it. We'll read from verse 1. Do we begin again to commend ourselves or do we need as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? He's saying, do we need recommendation letters? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. And we have such trust through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. Who also made us, suffic made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. So he's now talking about ministers of the new covenant. Not of letter. But of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So ministry under the old covenant was a ministry of letter. Doesn't mean they all had letter writing ministry. That's not what it means. It means it was a ministry of the law. Whereas ministry of the new covenant is a ministry of the Spirit. It is the Spirit of God flowing through us. The ministry of the law produced death. Can you imagine you come to church and they kill you? The ministry of the Spirit produced life. Built people up. Continue. Verse 7. But if the ministry of death written and engraved on stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory of his countenance, which, was, which glory was passing away, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more? So what's he saying? He's saying, look at the old covenant. It was a ministry of law. It was a ministry that produced, resulted in death. It was a ministry that was passing away. It was only temporal. The law has been done away with. But yet, under the law, it was so glorious. They had such a manifestation of the glory of God, people couldn't even look at the preacher. <laughs> Please look at me. No. <laughs> but he says, but how much more the ministry under the new covenant, which is the ministry of the spirit, which is the ministry of life, Shouldn't it be much more? This new covenant ministry is a more glorious ministry. Continue. Verse 9. For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in. The Old Testament ministry was ministry of condemnation. Some people are still doing Old Testament ministry. Condemning, condemning, condemning. He says, relax. Condemnation is not New Testament ministry. New Testament ministry is the ministry of righteousness. It tells people they are the righteousness of God. They are in right standing with God. They are holy and accepted in the eyes of God. That is is New Testament ministry. Amen? So when you listen to a preacher, you can decide, is he Old Testament ministry? <laughs> New Testament. Is it a ministry that condemns you? 
Or is it a ministry that awakens you to the righteousness of God? People always rise to the level of their approval. Amen? Simple. You tell a child, you're good, they'll be good. Tell a child, you're bad, they'll get worse. People always rise to the level of that's why God says, you are my righteousness. And then he says, walk in it. Live righteous. So the ministry of the New Testament is a ministry of righteousness. Now what does Paul say? He says, shouldn't this, isn't this ministry much more marvelous? Much more glorious. Let's continue. Therefore, verse 12, therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away. But their minds were blinded. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the whale is taken away. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into that same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. So contrasting, two, contrasting ministries under two covenants. In the old covenant, God chose certain individuals through whom he manifested his glory. In the new covenant, we all, with an unveiled face, are beholding the glory of the Lord. And we are all being changed into that same image. For what purpose? So that we all manifest his glory here on. So in New Testament ministry... Every believer is a minister. Amen. Tell your neighbor, you are a minister. Every believer is a minister of God. Through every believer, the glory of God is to be revealed. Why? Because every believer is looking at the glory of the Lord and being changed into that same image. In the old covenant, some individuals, Moses, Joshua, and Elijah, and Elijah, some people could see the glory of God manifest. The old covenant ministry was a ministry of the law. It produced death. It brought condemnation. It left people in a state where they didn't understand what was happening. They couldn't understand. It was like something covering their eyes. A whale was still on their eyes. They were still in bondage. New Covenant ministry is a ministry of the Spirit. It is a ministry that brings life. It's a ministry that awakens people to righteousness. It's a ministry that brings liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It's a ministry where all of us are being changed into His glory. And are able to manifest his glory. But here's the one point I want us to sit upon. He repeatedly says that new covenant ministry is much more glorious than Old Testament ministry. Much more glorious than the ministry that Moses had. Amen? That means all of us, every believer, is to manifest ministry that is more glorious than that of Moses. I mean, imagine what Moses did with the rods. We have television, media, this, that. Moses had nothing. Just the rods. 
swung his rod and a sea parted. Things happen. And Paul says, new believers and New Testament believers, we have a ministry that is more glorious. Meaning, the glory we must manifest of God, who God is and what he does, what we reveal through our lives, should be more glorious than what Moses revealed about God. Amen. I say, Pastor. I mean, why, why all this? More glorious ministry. I'm happy the way things are. That's the problem. Amen. If you go back in time, in the history of the church, to about 1400 AD. Just prior to that. The church was in. What we know as the dark ages. For a thousand years. The average man. Didn't. Read the Bible. It was in Latin. No access to it. The priests, the clergy were all civil servants appointed by the governments. And uh, many of them didn't read the word themselves. The church was, was essentially a place where there was liturgy, ritual, Sin was permitted as long as you paid cash for it. You could buy something called indulgences. Which was basically a license to sin. And the church gave you the license. Holy sin. Something. I don't know what it was. People prayed for the dead hoping that they'd make it to heaven. Call it purgatory. So that was the state of the church thousand in that period of time. Imagine if people said the way it is is always the way it will be. We would probably be in that same state. But I'm glad somebody said there is more. I'm glad Martin Luther stood up and said, look, this is not where we are supposed to be. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. And that began the process of reformation. And I'm glad it didn't stop there. I'm glad the Anabaptists came along and said, there is more. There's something called water baptism. They began to baptize people. I didn't stop there. I'm glad the Methodists came. John and Charles Wesley came and said, there is more. There's something called sanctification and holy living. I'm glad it didn't stop there. I'm glad somebody came and said, look, there is more. There's something called healing. God heals. People began to believe God for healing. And I'm glad it didn't stop there. Somebody else came along and said, there is more. There's something called the baptism in the Holy Spirit and praying in tongues. I'm glad it didn't stop there. Somebody came along and said, there is something called the word. We need to study it. And every promise of the word is ours. And we believe it. Have faith. Move mountain. Confess the word. I'm glad the church came into that. I'm glad it didn't stop there. Somebody came along and said, 
God is restoring the fivefold ministry. There are apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists in the body of Christ. Let's recognize them. I'm glad it didn't stop there. Somebody else said, look, the purpose of these fivefold gifts is for the equipping of the saints. So that the saints will do the work of the ministry. And people started saying, every believer is a minister. Amen. The church has come a long way. Because people refused to accept the status quo. And said, there is more. And this morning, I want to challenge you and me by saying, what we have today is not where we are supposed to be. There is more. We are supposed to be having a more glorious ministry than Father Moses. Amen? And if you want to come, come along. If you want to stay, goodbye. We're going! It's a more glorious ministry and that's where the church is supposed to be. That's where every believer is supposed to be. A more glorious ministry. Greater glory than what Moses had under the old covenant. Where we are is not where we are supposed to be. So don't accept this as the final destination. The bus is still moving. God is still driving. Stay on it. Amen? A more glorious ministry where the glory of God revealed through every believer will be greater than what Moses experienced under the old covenant. So we must be people saying, God, take us into it. We know we are not where we are supposed to be. The word it says, we're supposed to have a more glorious ministry. God, I shake ten rods and nothing happens. God, please save me. Help me, God. Do something. Take me into this more glorious ministry. The Bible says we're supposed to be having. Take me. Show me how to journey into it because... None of the present people living here have actually gone there. So show us how to journey into it. Some are a little ahead of us and so we can learn from them. But we are all supposed to go. Amen. So what does Paul say in verse 12? He says, Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of says, look, since we are so convinced, we know that we have a more glorious ministry. We have a ministry of the Holy Spirit flowing through us um, that enables us to write into the very hearts of people. We have a ministry of life. We have a ministry that brings righteousness. We have a ministry that sets people free. Since we have such a ministry, we are bold about it. Amen. So let's get bold about this ministry that God has given us. Let's be bold about it. That, 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 that when we minister, people are set free. Life comes through. Righteousness is imparted. People are uh, experience liberty. It's the ministry of the Spirit coming through us. Let's be bold. Let's expect more glory than Moses. Amen. And Paul continues in chapter 4 and verse 4. And he tells us. That the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. Lest the light of the glory of Christ. Who is the image of God. There's the gospel. Which is the, there's the light of the gospel. Which is the glory of Christ. Which is the image of God. To shine to them. The gospel. The gospel. The good news. Releases the glory 
of Christ. The glory of God. The good news. So be bold about the good news. Because that reveals the glory of God. Be bold about it. When you share the good news, you're being a New Testament minister. The Spirit of God is working through you. It will, the Spirit of God working through you will bring life, will bring righteousness, will bring liberty into those whom you serve. So be bold about it. Amen. What's it going to take for us to manifest this more glorious ministry? I don't know. We're all journeying into it. We're trying to discover. But when you look back at church history and look at those, those moments in the history of the church, in the book of Acts and other points of time in the history of the church and say where, where people experienced manifestations of the glory of God. And you look back and say, what caused it? Here are some common denominators that we see. God's glory is manifested among a people who are hungry. Amen. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. For they will be. They'll be filled. So we need to get hungry. Hungry for more. Never become satisfied with what you have. Not give God two hours on a Sunday. Fifteen minutes every day, my daily devotion. Satisfy this God. I don't know. Dangerous place. Dangerous place. There's got to be a holy hunger that stirs you up. That says, God, I'm not satisfied. A holy discontent. A holy dissatisfaction inside you. God, uh, I'm thankful for where we are, but I am not satisfied. Because there is more and I want more. When God sees a hungry people, he comes. He pours water on him who is thirsty. He said, I will, I will put floods on dry ground. What else do we notice? We notice that God, the glory of God is manifested among a people pursuing purity. Purity. If we are praying for a greater glory and a much glorious ministry, we must also be ready for greater levels of purity. Amen? You know, when there is greater glory, there is lesser tolerance for sin. When there is greater glory, there is greater grace, but there is lesser tolerance for sin. Ananias and Sapphira were just regular church members. Came to church one day. Small lie. Just a little lie. They dropped dead. In church. For lying. They preachers lie, nothing happened. Nobody drops dead. What's the difference? The glory of God. Where there is greater glory, there is greater grace, but also lesser tolerance for sin. The church at that time was in such glory that even shadow would heal people. People came flocking to services to be healed. In an atmosphere of great glory, God expects greater purity. Amen. 
What else do we see? We see people that people who walk in authority in the seasons of glory where the manifestation of God's glory was evident or much more greater than before. People walked in authority. They knew their authority in Jesus. and They walked in it. Think about Peter and John, Acts chapter 3. They're going to the temple to pray. There's a lame man there. And Peter says something that, would, that is so offensive. Lame man's begging, he's lame. What does Peter say? He didn't say, call the prayer tower. He didn't say, look to Jesus. What did Peter say? Look on us. Look at me. That sounds very sacrilegious. Why did Peter say, look on us, look me, look here? Because he knew who he was in God. He knew the authority he carried. So we make excuses. You know, call the prayer tower. Or call pastor. <laughs> Listen. We need to be a people. Not arrogant. Not self-confident. But we must know our authority in Jesus. Peter said, silver and gold I don't have, but such as I have, I've got something. I give you. The problem with the church today is either we don't know what we have, or we know what we have, but we don't use it. We want to be a people who will see this much more glorious ministry. We must step out on who we are in God. We must step out on the authority that God has given us. It doesn't matter who you are in the church. It doesn't matter how small or insignificant you may be. You are a minister of God. You have the glory of God in you. Tell people, look at me. I may not have much on the earth. Silver and gold I may not have. I got something that will meet your need. Such as I have, I give you. What else do we see? We see a people who walked in the anointing of the Spirit. Their dependence was on the Holy Spirit. They let the Spirit of God move through them, work through them. They were not apologetic of the work of the Spirit. I'm sorry. You know, the Holy Spirit sometimes inside me just ruffles his feathers a little bit. No. They did not apologize for the ministry of the Spirit through their lives. Amen. The Holy Spirit is gentle, but He needs no apology. So don't apologize for the work of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit gives you a word of knowledge, let it flow. The Holy Spirit gives you a word of prophecy, let it flow. The Holy Spirit promises you to do something for somebody, let it go. Don't apologize for the anointing of the Spirit flowing through your life. This is the ministry of the Spirit. And lastly, we see that these were a people who walked in unity. One thing in the book of Acts, you see often, they were of one accord. One accord. One accord. And there was great manifestations of glory. We need to be a people of one accord. Saying, we want to press in to the more that God has for us. Amen. Not satisfied with the way things are. There is more. We want to journey into it. If we are of one accord, ready to press in, God will meet us. Amen. There is a more glorious ministry. Let's journey into it. Let's stand to our feet. I want you to take a moment just to pray, then we will dismiss. 
I want to pray and say, God, if the Bible tells me that this New Testament ministry is a more glorious ministry, I want it. Please help me journey into it. I know I'm not there, but I want to journey into it. And would you pray for the church as well, saying, God, as a church, we must journey into what is ahead of us, into what you want for us. Please take us into it. Let's all pray. Let's all pray. Say, God, take us into this. Father, we heard your word this morning. We are thankful for those who in times past had a holy dissatisfaction in their lives so that they could disrupt the church and take it to where it's to the next level, God. For, Father, we pray that that same holy discontent will group our hearts, will stir us up, oh God, saying that there is a more glorious ministry and we want to go into it. But every believer ought to have a ministry that's more glorious than Moses. Take us into it, God. So that the earth will truly be filled with the glory of the Lord. That you will have a nation of people who will manifest your glory on this earth. Holy Spirit, come. Help us journey into it. Give us that hunger. Give us that purity. Give us that boldness to walk in authority. Give us that willingness to yield to the anointing of the Spirit. And God help us to be a people of unity. To make this journey into this more glorious ministry. Help us, O oh God. Let your glory be seen upon each of us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Before we close, if there's anyone here, you've never given your heart to Jesus Christ. It's great that you've come to church and spent time with us. But the greatest thing that can happen to you is to let Jesus come into your heart, into your life. Forgive your sins and make you a brand new person. That's the greatest thing that can happen to you. For Jesus to change you from inside out. And all permanent change comes from within. It begins on the inside. It comes from inside you. And only Jesus Christ can change you inside out. Religion tries to change you outside in. Jesus changes you inside out. Is anyone here this morning? You say, I want to be changed inside out. I want Jesus to come into my life, forgive my sins, set me free, and change me. If anyone here, and, and I want to pray with you before we dismiss, could you just raise your hands? Anyone here this morning? Say, I want to be changed inside out. Anyone? Just lift your hand up, please. Anybody here this morning? Outside, on the hallway? Anybody? Okay, I see one hand here. Anyone else? Say, Lord, I want to change inside out. Anyone else? All right, if you lifted your hand up, I want you to pray with me. Just pray this with, with me. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive my sins. Make me a new person. Change me inside out. Help me to follow you the rest of my life. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You pray this prayer with me. Just put your hand up once again. You pray this prayer with me this morning. Just put your hand up. Amen. God bless you. Anybody else? I can see it all. Let's give her a good hand. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. If you pray this prayer, I want you to come and meet Pastor Stephen Benny. Pastor Stephen Benny is right here in the blue shirt. Please come and meet him right after we dismiss. He will give you a new testament, spend some time with you, giving you a few instructions. So if you pray this prayer with me this morning to ask Jesus to change you inside out, please come meet with Pastor Stephen Benny. God bless you. Let's close. Arise and shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Though darkness covers the earth and deep darkness the people, yet the Lord shall arise upon you. And His glory will be seen upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day, great afternoon, great week. First time visitors, please make your way to the hall.
hallway towards my left, and the team will meet with you. If you pray that prayer, asking Jesus into your heart.